Welcome everybody to this webinar on innovation in the age of disruption. My name is Janet Hammer Andersen. I work as a professor at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, and I'm involved in uh, Digital Life Norway, and I have the honor of being the moderator of this webinar. So this webinar is co-hosted by the Center of Digital Life Norway and the Life Science Cluster. So Center of Digital Life Norway is a national center for biotechnology research, education, and innovation. The center shall facilitate transdisciplinary collaboration across institution fields of research and the research projects in the center. And we also have the life science cluster here. So Hanna Mette, you might say some word about the life science cluster. Thank you very much, uh, Shanet. And we're very happy to do this uh, webinar together and also with our uh, distinguished guests that you will present uh, later on. So the Life Science Cluster, we are a network of companies and organizations uh, for which uh, life science is key. So we have approximately 120 members across uh, both health, technology, uh, marine and agricultural life sciences. Um, and also we are uh, aiming to strengthen collaboration between the different kinds of players. So we really look forward to this webinar. Thank you, Hanna Mette. So the topic of today is uh, innovation in the age of disruption. So the program is that we will have a, a, a talk from uh, Professor Jerome Engel, and then we will have a discussion with the panelists. So I will introduce them now, but they will also have time later to say something more. So we have with us Professor Jerome Engel from University of California at Berkeley. He is an internationally recognized expert on innovation, entrepreneurship, venture capital lecturing, and advising business and government leaders around the world. We also have the pleasure to have Natsai Audrey Chisa. She's a founder and CEO at Faber Futures. She's a leading thinker on transformative role design can play in the equitable development on consumer biotechnology. And also Anita patel Yusnes, which is currently a, a patient journal chapter lead at Roche, which is also a member of the Life Science Cluster. She also recently just came from genetic analysis. We might hear more about that later. She has uh, almost 25 years experience in biotechnology. So we are really happy to have such a uh, diverse, but also very competent panel. I'm looking forward to, to listening in and hear more about your background and expertise. But first I will give the screen to Professor Engel to give us a presentation about innovation in the age of disruption, please. Well, well, thank you so much. It's a true pleasure to be with everybody this morning or this afternoon in your case. I'm talking to you from Silicon Valley or uh, the town of San Rafael, if you're familiar with the Bay Area. And I come to this topic um, as a practitioner. I wanna share that and an investor, even though I am um, a professor at the university uh, and have an academic background, uh, my real perspective is as um, somebody who helps build businesses and observing how they evolve. So I've uh, been uh, a venture capitalist. I founded a couple of businesses of my own, one of which was successful, the others totally failed. And I have a lot of big company experience in terms of management uh, at Ernst & Young and KPMG and uh, in other venues. So in my career, I had the great opportunity of having people come uh, and ask me essentially, how does Silicon Valley work? So uh, of course, that's a, a bit of an absurd question, but it's an important one. I mean, it's difficult to get your arms around. And I figured I had to develop an answer. So when I joined the faculty at UC Berkeley, I used that opportunity to reflect on what can I add to the literature? Or what can I add to the teaching experience? And this question of what makes a community of innovation work became central to me over the last uh, decades. And that's where I've published and done my work. The thing about that that's important for us is that certainly in this, dec in this century, if you will, and since 2000, we've seen so many disruptions. And the question is, um, you know, are these macroeconomic disruptions and disruptions of the sort of ecosphere of entrepreneurship and innovation, how do they trigger each other, how do they interrelate? And more recently with the COVID disruption, 
you know, how responsive are these innovation communities? Uh, and how responsive are the individual components of those communities? And how should that affect how we do our work, do our research, think about opportunity, and think about the lifetime of innovation and how to have innovation with impact. Uh, in preparing my talk today, I came up with these topics. The challenge that we face in the turbulent time, the role of geography, which I think is uh, substantial. What is the opportunity that comes from disruption and what strategies can we adopt to encourage a flywheel or a virtual um, value creation cycle? So let's look for a moment at the obvious question about what makes our time a turbulent time and is it unique in its level of turbulence? My thesis is going to be based on my observations in my own community. This is a picture of Berkeley and because that's where my personal ecosystem anchors, but also in research I've done in collaboration with uh, 20 plus academics around the world who've looked and we've used a common framework to look at our own ecosystems. And this goes from Barcelona to Singapore, um, even to, I shouldn't say even to Norway, and to Norway, uh, and in the life sciences sphere there. So we've looked at a number of ecosystems around the world, and we've reached some generalized conclusions, and I'm gonna share them with you. This innovation theme is an important one to understand from the perspective of that change is intrinsic, I think, in the innovation context. That innovation means you're moving from one state to another state, and hopefully in a constructive direction. So I generally use the definition for innovation to be a constructive response to stress or change. Oftentimes that stressor, that uh, forcing function of change, is technology because it's that incremental, ongoing scientific discovery and engineering application of technology to problems that puts pressure on incumbents. In other words, those, those companies, those power uh, centers that currently control access to the beneficiary, the customer, the end user. And without this pressure of technological change or um, ecological change, external pressures, those who have control will stay in control. The incumbents don't want to be disrupted. So COVID-19 is the obvious uh, example for us in healthcare, but you know there are more recent examples as well. But when you looked at that, you wondered if you know it's such a big crisis, how did we adopt? Well, we adopted by going online. And you wonder, is the world ever going to be the same again? Will we always be looking at the world through this lens of innovation? looking back pre-March 2020 versus post-March 2020. But you know, the, the shocks didn't stop coming, of course, with war in Europe, we have inflation, we have supply chain chaos with the restoration of uh, demand side as the economies come back. And, you know, and more recently, the one that's been very much on our minds uh, here in Silicon Valley is, is of course the banking failure we had, which totally was unexpected. And there are many lessons to be learned there, but it's not the obvious failure of a bank taking risk. It's the, it's the unobvious fact that they had huge deposits because of the strength of the venture capital economy and the company is not wanting to take risk with their cash. So they put it in the bank that was the favorite bank of the community. And that bank didn't match the timing of their investments with the capital requirements of the companies. Because as we have the down cycle in venture capital, which we're having right now, that created a, a withdrawal demand that could not be met. So that creates these huge shocks. And that was like out of left field. So we don't know where these shocks are gonna come from. So the question is really, well, we can't plan, you know, on exactly what the shock's gonna be, but can we plan to be responsive? And are looking at these, we looked at 20 plus communities and when we looked at them, we found that indeed communities that focus on innovation and in short cycle deployment of technology have 
more skill at responding to disruptions and can take advantage of them. So is that a lucky situation? Well, if you ask you know, Richard Hammond, famous mathematician, Louis Pasteur, they both had the same quote essentially, is that luck favors the prepared. And so innovation and the response to innovation like Zoom and the tool we're using right now for a global conference, that was so quick to respond, but it didn't come overnight. In other words, Zoom was, you know, there's Skype, there was Zoom, there were other solutions out there that were putting years of effort into creating these platforms. So they were robust enough to respond when a need was there. And then they became ubiquitous. So how does that apply to us in healthcare? Well, the obvious is the vaccine, right? I mean, mRNA technology did not come overnight. It's been uh, you know, in development for many years. Its use in vaccine development was you know, well-established in the research level. So, but would it have ever penetrated you know, the large incumbents? Would it have disrupted them? Yeah, maybe at some point, but this was the point because all of a sudden there was a global problem and we needed a global response and the capital was there and the energy was there. And if you look at the solutions, the key is in reducing that you know, four year development time to a four month development time, you look at all these different solutions brought to you by Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson and Novamax, they're all partnerships with small companies who develop the technology and then license a partner that technology to large companies that could do the large scale um, vaccine development rapidly. The one exception, of course, is Moderna, which is that there's always an exception to the case. But the thesis here is that large companies can be disrupted from within by looking to small companies to gain access to the edge case, to the special case, to the unique case. And then when mass markets uh, become available, those partnerships can lead the way and in some cases, companies individually can break through and sustain their independence and participate like Moderna has done so well. So, you know, there are many vectors in healthcare for this type of innovation that have been opened up through, uh, you know, CRISPR and you know, other molecular, molecular design technologies. And we're gonna see these breakthroughs occur sometimes incrementally and sometimes seemingly overnight. The other point I would raise is crossovers. In other words, this is not just genetic or biotechnology, if you will, but it's um, crossovers from other fields like artificial intelligence obviously is all in the news, but robotics and microfluidics, you know, sensors. These are all technologies that cross over into life sciences. And we're gonna see, you know, and we are seeing tremendous leapfrog gains in crossover uh, applications. Uh, you know, designer babies are not a thing of the future anymore. It's it's uh, it's a it's a capability that uh, is highly um, uh, controversial, and I'm not endorsing it by any means. But the idea that we can um, uh, engineer the genome is well understood, and uh, there are companies who do that in some form or another. Uh, personalized medicine, we have you know, recognitions of that. Uh, new models for uh, throughput on therapeutics. Um, of course, CRISPR and the great rapid deployment we see of that now in many different venues. Um, and the example I like to point to, uh, you know, if you go back a couple of decades was PCR. All of us that are lab scientists probably have PCR machines at the end of the bench. And we might take them for granted because they cost us a few thousand dollars. It's not a major investment. But when they you know, developed uh, the PCR in my, it came out of some science at Berkeley and uh, it was commercialized, et cetera. The, I saw the rapid, the, you know, reduction of, of a lab scale device that, you know, would cost millions of dollars to build. And it was not a very, you know, smooth looking device. These little bench devices that cost a few thousand dollars. It's that kind of scaling. And now with robotics, uh, you know, these efficiencies, uh, take things that are moving relatively slow and make them much shorter cycle. Life sciences is known for having life, long life cycle developments. 
and, and but we're seeing them compressed, especially with the crossover of artificial intelligence and sensors, et cetera. So how do we accelerate these slow industries like life sciences? And just quickly, um, if you take defense spending, that's a real place where technology gets deployed. And this um, drone, you know, these drones are very popular these days, unfortunately, in the armed services when um, they're, they're in combat now every day over uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, a major component of this uh, drone is its uh, intelligence system. And there was a bespoke or a unique system that was built uh, for this drone that um, a young scientist playing around with one, you know, on the Defense Department's budget, discovered that they could replace this very bespoke six thousand uh, dollar computer with essentially an Apple uh, handheld computer. So essentially, they've taken the guts of your telephone and gotten a ten to one cost advantage by using what they call off-the-shelf technology versus bespoke custom technology. That's a crossover in a very crude sense. And look at, let's look at this one. You know, is this, a, it's a Fitbit, obviously, right? And when they first came out, you know, is it a fad, you know, is it, or is it just something fabulous? And by fabulous, I mean like, oh my God, how fabulous that is, look, it's so cute. You know, well, toy or tool, it's, you know, now we're all wearing, I mean, I'm wearing on my wrist, I mean, exactly this watch you're seeing here. And, uh, you know, it, it has a lot of uh, medical applications as we're all familiar. I mean, I can take an EKG, uh, while it's a crude one, I can do an EKG. And if uh, I'm sure we're gonna have these types of consumer devices actually taken seriously by the medical professionals over time, but I can take an EKG and uh, make, create a PDF and ship it off to my, uh, doctor, and he can have a quick look and tell me whether I got to come in or not, rather than having to go to the emergency room and, um, you know, utilize resources that may not be necessary. So anyway, these this is now also moving to have a, you know, a, a sensor involved uh, for measuring uh, blood sugar levels and blood oxygen levels. So we know with diabetes, how crucial blood sugar and insulin level uh, measurement is. And um, how invasive that is to do the thumb prick. Well, that's all going to be a thing of the past uh, within a few years. So these are not toys. They are really tools. And this continuous non-invasive remotely monitored and maybe AI monitored uh, type of capability is coming uh, very quickly. So this is what I call innovation from the edge. It's the innovation got deployed in a consumer space. And the advantage of that is that there are thousands and thousands of deployments, millions of deployments, uh, and therefore you get uh, a better opportunity to low risk incrementally enhance the technology that can then cross over to the serious application. If you start with the goal of building, you know, the serious medical application, you run right into the regulatory constraints right into the safety constraints where if you start with the trivial if you will keeping time on your wrist application and having that harmonized with you know some other trend like uh, mobile telephones you have these huge number of opportunities for deployment and, and innovation so we're seeing that happen in artificial intelligence um, and this is of course the disruptive platform of the day i mean the internet was a disruptive platform in its day you know, then the World Wide Web, and now AI, and it'll be just as disruptive. And as in many innovations, the initial innovations here, you can see on the seat map back in, back in 2015, we're in healthcare, because people want to save lives, and it makes sense that like we have this capability, let's see if we can deploy it immediately where it's most important. But very quickly, when you see a good platform, this is just two years later, the same heat map, it essentially shows the quick diffusion, you know, by 2017. And now or five years later, this heat map would not make any sense anymore because it would all just be red. So many young companies starting to deploy innovations across industries. So I, I, the examples of digital health, obviously, uh, are right on the table for this group. And again, I want to thank Digital Health Norway and the Life Science Cluster for giving me a chance to make this point to this important audience. So. You can look, if you want to see where there's evolution and going to be in med tech, you can look at what's going on in sports tech. In other words, 
things that are deployed for sport where it's non-critical oftentimes can cross over to medical applications. So we could discuss some of these, some of these examples when we have time, uh, but you might wanna look at Neurotrainer, which is a company doing exactly that, uh, using measurements of neuroscience uh, inputs around the brain. Uh, and now the next question is how do you get the scale? The, the first point was you got the speed by working with young companies. How do you get the scale? And that's uh, you know, the real challenge. And I'm saying co combining oftentimes the innovation that resides in emergency in a small company with big companies that have global penetration, that can be um, a clue for scale. But, and in the longer term, we're gonna see scale impacted by the emerging middle class around the world. And that in serving the unserved populations, if you will, are the real thresholds for a lot of uh, the technologies we're working on. It's not just in the first world, but also in the third world. Uh, and diabetes is an example for that. Diabetes is a place where a lot of people place a lot of attention. Obviously, in the United States, we have a uh, you know, high consumption, high sugar, high diabetes uh, population. Uh, but where else do you have it? You have it in India and you have it in China. So we might see, you know, um, real experimentation and real adoption coming in different markets where they might have a different regulatory approach because of not having the uh, distribution system uh, that first world nations have. And I apologize to anybody who just caught me calling China not a first world system. But you know, there, there, are, two, there are two worlds in China. There's the first world for sure, that's 350 million people. And then there's the unserved population, the rural population of a billion people. So they have both components. Same thing for India. So speed and scale, you get there through this combination. And you know that you can look at uh, the generic attributes of innovation and you bring it into uh, life sciences and healthcare. And when I look at life sciences and healthcare, I wanna emphasize there's not just product innovation. It's not just the things that become innovative. It's the hows as well. So the hows you might call as business model innovation, you know, new treatment models or even new financial models for reimbursement. And there's innovation in governance. Uh, for instance, in the United States, we struggle with our system because we don't have a single single payer model. We don't have vote. In the US they call socialized medicine, simply meaning government reimbursement. We have a combined model, which is really uh, socialized in its base, but layered on top of an insurance model where the individual or the employer pays for insurance. So it's a very inefficient system. And in the US, a lot of healthcare innovation in the long term, if it's going to have effect, it's going to require uh, innovation in our governance. So, what's the role of geography? And I'll touch on this just quickly, but it's 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 one of my central interests. And my hypothesis for you is that where you are impacts how you innovate. And when I look at San Francisco as a as a case, and I look at it, you know. Uh, 20 years ago, the skyline was a financially centered skyline. The pyramid is an insurance company. The big black box here is the biggest bank, Bank of America. Um, you know, these are all financial institutions and professions that serve them. If you look at that same place through a different lens 20 years later, these are all technology companies. And those financial companies are down here. I mean, they're, they're like physically surpassed, if you will by the physical manifestation of software firms and every internet vertical you can think of. Uh, they didn't locate in Silicon Valley, they located in the city. And why? It's because the people working in those firms wanted to live in the city. And that's a new, this idea of concentration of people and concentration of industry and seeking urban core settings for that is a new evolution. So when you look at this geography, you, know, you can look at different maps and you look at the people in those maps and who leads and who follows. And I'm just taking you on a tour here of different innovation uh, neighborhoods I've visited or 
uh, lectured at, even in Russia, if you will. But the most interesting one for me, because it's so clear, uh, is Israel and the Tel Aviv Silicon Valley connection and this idea of these concentrations of places of change. And even back, um, uh, this happened to be Barcelona. Uh, so, you know, even back uh, in 90, oh, 2014, when I was in Tel Aviv, I was going to talk about that example. The thing I, I love that I saw is a meetup. In other words, I was coming back to my hotel and they were hanging the sign, you know, that is, uh, you know, a bunch of engineers were going to get together and talk about um, innovation, like we are today. And it's these meetups, these, these congruences, when you bring people together with shared interests that go beyond their enterprise, you know, that, that break the, the barriers of the enterprise, whether it's an academic institution or a business enterprise, and you get cross fertilization, that's when you get this great behavior. And so geography matters. There are concentrations of industries, as Michael Porter pointed out, but it's the emergence, it's creating communities where the emergence of new businesses is part of the very center of their identity. And that creates a different view on innovation that moves to a behavior centric view. And we don't have time to go into that now. We might discuss it in the Q&A. So that kind of evolution leads to building communities that have sequential evolutions, not just one uh, center of evolution. And these are um, cross-disciplinary and uh, cross-cultural almost. Uh, it takes engineers working with scientists, physicists working with chemists, uh, computer scientists working with mathematicians, working with biologists. Um, all this builds congruence and power. So we like to say that Silicon Valley is a state of mind. In other words, um, that innovation communities, it's a state of mind. And, and I'm just showing you some of the research we did to support that, um, two publications of, that include these um, examples. And, um, you know, the thesis of clustering was supported across all these ecosystems. And uh, we, so we might think about how we collaborate with others in our ecosystems. We distilled it to seven components and five behaviors. I'll just touch on them as I wrap up. The seven components, there's nothing very uh, unique about identifying the components of an of a innovation ecosystem. Sure, we have universities creating technology, entrepreneurs exploiting the technology, hopefully financial sources like venture capital or government uh, funds uh, supporting their scaling, and then major corporations participating in the process. And we saw how that happened. So there's a virtual cycle that can be created that takes advantage of large pools of money in government and in pension funds, and takes advantage when it's available in the public markets to benchmark the value of these private enterprises and to create an exit opportunity. These are the elements in a very rough way of the cluster of innovation, these seven elements, the foundational elements of the universities, the management professionals and government, and the active uh, major elements, the entrepreneurs, the venture capital investors, and the major corporations. Every economy is different. Some, like Singapore, have a strong government influence and funding. Uh, some, like Europe, have uh, a dominance by the major corporations. But every community has the same seven elements. They interact. So in creating this kind of community, we can look at context, the actors, and the enablers. So the actors are the middle three components. They're the core actors. The supporting elements are the four I mentioned. They're essential to create the context for innovation. And that can lead to uh, a faster, more innovative society. Entrepreneurs bring the speed. And let me just share one framework with you, which I think is essential for um, everyone to understand that this S curve of innovation 
um, really reflects what we're all involved in, whether it's research or deployment of technology at maturity. And the space where the rubber meets the road, if you will, where real, where new technologies and new business models, new deployment happen, are right here where the curve accelerates. And this isn't one business or just, it's really the view of an emerging technology. That technology may get deployed in a number of businesses in this cycle of rapid innovation. So everybody has a role to play. The, um, and that's about the universities, create the research and uh, you know, identify the intellectual property and capabilities, the entrepreneurs, accelerate the innovation process and the major corporations can be a real aid to, um, to bring this all to scale. So with that, there's much I could share about the entrepreneurial context, but the important thing to take away here is that the components interact. And that behaviors are the key. So these behaviors are win-win behaviors. And I just want to mention the five key behaviors are encouraging the mobility of resource, encouraging the entrepreneurial process, coming to agreements that align interests together, and take a global perspective on opportunity. And don't just look to local partners for linkages, but look for global linkages. So mobility of resources is the money, people, and know-how. The entrepreneurial process is a relentless pursuit of opportunity. The alignment of interest is shared risk and shared reward, oftentimes shared ownership. The global perspective is being born global, thinking of opportunity from a global perspective from day one. And the linkages are recognizing that global opportunities are pursued in partnership with people in other communities. So we have to have the uh, sensitivity as to how to build those global relationships. So with that, I'll close my remarks and thank you for your attention and turn it back to, um, to our chairperson for leading the questions with the panel. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you very much for this really nice presentation. It's very inspiring. I started reading your book, this uh, cluster of innovation in the age of disruption. And really, I think the, the components and like you say, the ecosystem, the behavior, these are things that needs to be matched up to really do the innovation. But I think as you said, uh, geographic matters. So if you are in an environment that allows you to sort of work around this and sort of build the behavior that's needed to do the innovation. So uh, we should now uh, get to on with some questions. And if there are questions from, from the chat, I will have a look. But before that, I will ask, uh, uh, starting off uh, with Natsai, maybe you could say something, introduce yourself to us. I gave you a brief introduction, but to the audience, please. Thank you, Jeanette. And thank you so much, Jerome, for that brilliant presentation. Um, my name is Natsai Audrey Chieva, and I'm the founder of Faber Futures. We are a London-based agency that works at the intersection of biotechnology, design, and society. And really, our core mission is to upstream the, the, the tool set that designers have in the design of the kinds of systems we need to scale biotechnology in such a way that it can deliver benefit um, and in an equitable way. So it's a very niche preoccupation that I have and have spent um, many years trying to make the case for, first of all, what is design, um, particularly when you are uh, interfacing with technologists and scientists who call themselves organism designers, for example. And then you quickly realize once you start talking that we are designing different contexts and different scale. Um, how do we start to bring those two things together? And this matters um, primarily because what's designed in the lab is going to go out into the wild and live in the real world. And designers are very adept at understanding, at least from an anthropological lens, the implications of real, real world context for anything that is designed. So my um, studio 
really focuses on finding different ways to build out some of the potential um, futures that uh, emerging uh, biotechnologies may have, particularly in the context of materiality. And so if you can engineer an organism in the lab for it to create a bioconcrete, how does that map onto um, architecture? My background is architecture, so this is very important to understand what are the implications of growing materials, growing buildings, as opposed to building buildings. Um, so design is a very useful tool to unpack what that means from a philosophical perspective, um, from a technical one, but crucially from a creative one. Because I think what we need is, you know, just looking at this notion of um, entrepreneurship and innovation as a team sport, um, who's on the team and when do they get to play? And I think what we see with innovation is that uh, the humanities and creativity, the poets come in right at the end, a lot of the times to put lipstick on a pig. So how do we undo that and enable the creatives to come into the lab space to start helping determine and shape what the core research question is? So that's primarily what I um, focus on. And we do so with a range of different stakeholders within, I guess, what would be framed as the bioeconomy. So from policymakers to biotech startups, usually in Silicon Valley, usually in the uh, east coast of um, the United States, because that's where the concentration of much of this is. Um, but we also work with institutions who have a wider reach through the public sphere in starting to communicate in the kind of technological changes that are coming. Um, and again, design is a brilliant vehicle to do this. Great, thank you. Nasai. I really like you that you have the, this on Faber Future, learning from nature, making with life. I really like that statement that you have on your web page. I will come back with some questions for you. So Anita, could you say introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. This is really, really inspiring. After listening to Professor Engel and also you, Nasai, I feel like we just, you know, in, in the age of innovation and disruption, it's got getting more and more normal in a way. It's not going to be... Is, is the new normal, if you can say. Uh, my background is uh, pharma uh, predominantly because I started in GSK and worked in the larger corporation who take all this innovation to the market. But I also worked in mid-sized companies, Norwegian companies like Pronova, Bio, uh, Biopharma, who had the um, fish oil, fish oil uh, refinery innovation that took the world by storm by making a pharma product out of omega-3. So, I mean, this is also a story that I like to share because it shows, you know, from the, like you said, Nasai, from the lab to the uh, the whole world, it's, it became a billion dollar product and it's done all through partnership and ecosystems like the professor told us. So I had that experience and then I also joined uh, a Norwegian startup two years ago, which um, was introduced by Jeanette called Genetic Analysis. And here I work with Microbiome and Microbiome's role in future uh, healthcare in terms of prevention, treatment, and also diagnostics. It's, it's an amazing uncovered potential there that I think is going to disrupt the way we look at medicine in the future. So that part was really exciting for me to be a part of. And now I jump back to the larger corporation and I'm proud to be a part of Rush today and, and also to be able to connect these dots. If you may, uh, like uh, Professor Engel said that there are so many components that need to be in place. And me being here in Oslo in Norway, I, I really would like us to, to think in, in, the, in the whole um, uh, area space of, of clustering and not only geographically, but also like digitally, I think we have so much more we can do uh, here in Norway. So I'm a big passionate about, you know, the life science cluster and how to, to build that science park in Oslo that's coming up, you know, uh, is, are we going to do the traditional mix there or are we going to disrupt the way we think in Norway as well? So this is me in a nutshell, uh, also proud to, to take questions, but I, really think that we're in the time of innovation where innovation and disruption is normal and that that's the that's the that's the both scary part but also a, a opportunity part that lies ahead of us thank you anita yeah so that sort of uh, your last words there sort of leads me into direct my the first question i have so 
about fear, like in this age, is innovation uh, driven by the desire to mitigate fear or to embrace the abundance? Like, or in other words, faced by climate change, COVID, war, and other crises, what is really driving innovation today? And maybe I can ask you, Natsai, to start off answering. It's a big question, I think, um, but it does have implications because it's really about flame framing. Um, and uh, when you start to frame a, a problem in a certain way, it, it's going to um, lead to certain outcomes. And so maybe the example that I can give in industrial biotechnology, very much the trend there is if we are thinking about making new materials out of biological systems, um, there's a tendency towards uh, formulating the solution according to where it can fit into existing systems without having a critical perspective as to whether or not that existing system is the one that we desire for the future. And the argument that's always made is the drop in replacement is cheap, it's efficient, and we just don't really have to change much except for the core ingredient. And for me, this sounds like fear because it's not wanting to actually push the boundaries as to what can innovation look like. It's not questioning business models. It's not questioning um, whether or not we are satisfied with the status quo. It's so a one really key example that I always like to use in um, uh, is, is actually in fast fashion. So biotechnology offers us uh, a plethora of uh, new chemical inputs that are really um, going to change the uh, environmental impact on how we uh, produce, manufacture, and distribute textiles um, through to fashion and interiors. The textile industry is one of the most polluting in the world, I think second only to the fossil fuel industry. That's not a mistake because so much of that materiality comes directly from fossil fuels. So when we look at pigments, for example, pigment production, uh, fossil fuel pigment production, its toxicity, its requirements around water, biotechnology offers um, you know, real solutions to that bio-based chemical inputs that are grown at ambient temperature or fermented, I should say, at ambient temperature by microbes. So from a design perspective, I think, wow, well, if we're fermenting these organisms to create pigment that's going to go on a textile and that textile is going to be used in fashion, that potentially doesn't just disrupt the chemical industry it disrupts fashion manufacturing and production and even distribution. It, dis it disrupts culturally how we understand the fashion object, which is really important because the dangers of then focusing on the drop in replacements because it's cheap, it plugs into existing industry and frameworks and supply chains is that we end up using these so called innovations uh, for industries that some would argue are part of the problem for industries that we actually also need to divest from, from industries that are creating waste that's ending up in landfill and in our oceans. So for me, maybe if we step back and say, are we trying to solve a climate um, crisis or biodiversity crisis? Uh, and is the drop in replacement, i.e. looking at it from a systems point of view, um, the way to go, some would argue that no, it's not. <laughs> and so if we think more creatively about um, other ways of deploying at scale those technology that aren't about producing um, a pigment molecule that has parity to the fossil fuel equivalent, but that is driven by how do we have secure supply chains that employ craftspeople across the world, of which there are many, by the way, um, and that help to um, that help to reinforce existing industries in fashion where they are, then you can start to have a slightly different, less panicked response to what innovation can look like there. And so for me, the, the idea of distributed biotechnology is an invitation to think beyond the fears that lead to risk management um, perspectives around how to scale and help us think about other ways of doing things. So I, I think that on a case by case basis, there are plenty of examples where fear is leading the thought process as to how innovation should play out. Um, and I think it's really important to be able to step back and, um, and think otherwise. Mm, thank you. Jerry, you have a comment on this? Yeah, it's <clears throat> both. Okay, your question was, is it fear or opportunity, right? And the answer has to be both. I mean, it, it, and, but what creates a sustainable uh, innovation 
is that the thing you're responding to has enough stability, that the problem statement has enough stability that you get to experiment and deploy over and over again, different solutions against it. So the opportunity-centric innovation is more interesting in a way because it appeals to you know, um, the process of science. Science takes decades to evolve its uh, discoveries and then to uh, translate them into practice is a, a real challenge. But it's a, it's pretty, compared to crisis response, um, it's a pretty sane environment. And we have ways to stress it, to accelerate it. We call it, you know, lean innovation, lean launchpad. There are different things we've even done together, um, you know, in seminars to teach different ways of quickly experimenting with different business models, discovering product market fit. But that's all opportunity centric. The, the response to a challenge that's um, a fearful response drives quick experiments because of the urgency. And those experiments, when the crisis resolves, those solutions may have been good in that moment, but may not be robust. So you might do, do a step up and then a step back because you've done a quick solution. You put a Band-Aid on the wound, but in the end, you have to go back and suture the wound and, and, and try and cure it correctly. So I, I definitely think uh, stress for innovation comes from both dimensions, fear and opportunity. I think the key is to try and think of what you can achieve with the resources you can access and stimulate. So within the time frame you have. And those resources are going to come from various players, but if you don't have the ability to get access to the players that have the resources and, and convert them to your cause, uh, that's the key for collaboration. So in a longer time frame, when you're opportunity centric, uh, the other players may not feel the urgency, right? Because they're stable, they're in place, they have the money to invest or they have the access to the markets, they have products to serve those markets. Uh, so I, I hope this answer means something that can be translated to reality for the group we have here. But, you know, if we look at what's going to come out of war, I hate to say that, but um, there must be tremendous innovations happening right now in the world where people are under, you know, at war, where they're under real imminent threats. And they're doing things that are that we don't even know about because they're just doing them. They, they're not doing them to achieve an opportunity. They're doing them to survive. Some of those things we're going to look three, four years from now and look back and say, oh, where'd this come from? Oh, well, that was because we didn't have any of X and we needed, we substituted Y and it helped us. And that substitution happened and it stuck and maybe it sticks for the long term. Uh, but the opportunity centric one is one that appeals to the scientists, I think, because it's the everybody can perceive rightly or wrongly where they think their science has an opportunity to be deployed. The yeah. challenge is that oftentimes those expectations are not real, right? Yeah. You just have to I, have the real world experiment. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So, so what I see is like, looking back at the COVID, so there was a lot of thing, research going on that we could uh, speed up from based on fear when the COVID hit sort of a lot of things that already were existing technology that people were researching on came suddenly like based on fear that you could gather and all the regulatory stuff, you could speed up the process, but you need to have had something in place in the innovation system to sort of, to sort of take that moment of opportunity. No, uh, I, just to emphasize that point is right. You, it's the opportunity you've been working on for five years. All of a sudden you say, gee, there's a, a need this moment and other people recognize it and give you the opportunity to deploy it. That's mRNA right there. Hmm. Yes. And then what we also saw with COVID was that on distribution, I mean, there are parts of the world that haven't received vaccinations yet. We've all moved on in the West and yet there's a gap in distributing the benefits of that rapid innovation. So I think that's going to be the, the challenge in the long term is where's how do we how do we design for parity? Hmm. 
Definitely. Well, I'd, lo I'd love to hear from the other panelists on that because that's a real disturbing fact. I mean, and it's not just, you know, the, um, it's not just the vaccine, it's food. <laughs> you know, you can take yeah. almost anything that's essential to life. And you recognize that the world only, we don't solve problems based on uh, happiness. We solve problems based on capital exchange, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's beyond the scope of our discussion, but it is really central as to healthcare. What is that? What is a human right? And mm -hmm. uh, what obligation do, the, do we all have to share? Yeah, so that could sort of lead me on, Anita, maybe you can pick up on the previous question if you like, but also like thinking about like when we're having with this uh, COVID and what the war, like there are the supply chains that we have, like, are we just rebuilding the same ones that we had or have we made some like, through novel innovation sort of like this? But as she said, there are some parts of the world that the mm -hmm. supply chains are not even going to, but do you have any thoughts about this, Anita? I, I don't have the facts or any detailed knowledge about all the world's distribution, but it, it's a fact that we all feel the whole world felt like the innovation came fast in terms of vaccines. And some parts of the world, the Russians made their own vaccines. And, you know, there are so many, there, there's so many uh, different versions of the story. But I feel like if it happens again, this is my question, what would we do differently? uh is it what have we learned you know this is what everybody's talking about now what did covid learn uh, teach us and what, what did we learn the industry learned a lot uh the the governments learned a lot the healthcare public sector learned a lot so i mean the, these learnings need to to be consolidated and then you know at the next time next crisis we need to be more prepared this is my take on evolution of getting better and creating a better uh, world uh, it's not the not say the the full um uh, vision that you have but it is important that we uh, have this uh, learning mindset not only innovating and entrepreneurship but also learning and uh, and and also build on the learnings so that's what i would just want to say generally but i want to comment on the 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 risk taking part when disruption comes i mean big and large corporation and venture capitalists don't you think they will sit tighter uh, on their capital and and secure their part of the of the business or the investments uh, and then the acceleration of the innovation will go fast and and be like you said uh, uh, a, a quick a run but then it will be slowed down by the, the curve when it comes up to the scale and the part where you need capital that's what I, i'm worried about now moving forward when we're in the middle of the crisis uh, where does you know all this uh, capital come from that we need to scale up is yes. that the larger corporations or is it the responsibility of the public private sector that needs to step up and yeah, it's a it's a big question, but I, I'm I'm really struggling with that because we see also that innovation will die. Uh, you know, there's a lot of companies I know that are you know right at the edge of dying now because of this situation. They cannot find funding. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's really critical. Hmm. And I see Jerry, you were about to say something. I, I could address that if you'd like. I mean, it's a messy process. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's just an ugly. Uh, wasteful process in a way. What I'm talking about is innovation, venture capital, uh, new company formation. You can say it all with a smile and say, oh, look at this great value creation. And it is net, net, bottom line, end of the day, inputs in are less than the outputs out. In other words, this process of innovation and venture capital, new company formation, entrepreneurship creates value. Does it create value for everybody in the process? Absolutely not. It's about, um, it's, it's a private marketplace uh, stimulated by um, people seeking returns, in other words, profits. And different players have different appetites for different types of risk. And they participate uh, on daily judgments. In other words, they can make a support a company at one point and later on not want to support that same company, even though they're already invested and they're going to lose their investment if they don't continue to support. 
But if we didn't have that marketplace pressure, we also wouldn't have productivity. So um, it, it, it's the, the key, if there is a key, is to help create a system that recognizes that failure is not failure. In other words, that failure may mean failure in terms of economic loss and years spent on something that doesn't come to fruition. But the society does not look at those individuals and say they failed, therefore they're people who fail, therefore we don't support them. Societies can look at people who have endeavored to create value and say, these are people who have learned a lot, but they've gained is experience. And so I hate to say the trite thing, but in the trite statement is in Silicon Valley, we don't call failure failure, we call failure experience. And in fact, when you're hiring um, you know, uh, somebody and they say, well, I've been at three companies and two of them failed, you know, and one had successes in this way. You look at each of those failures, not as failures, but you try and learn, well, what did you learn from that experience? What was the cause of failure? Was it internal, external, et cetera, yada, yada. And so there's not a cultural bias. And that is um, one of the elements of a system of innovation where our community uh, recognizes the value creation even when the business fails. Now, the fact that, I mean, you asked a very big question. I'd go on forever. I apologize. But that I'll just keep it short and just say it's a messy process. And the true scaling oftentimes requires a concentration of marketplace around a single standard or a single solution that gains traction. When that happens, a lot of other solutions fall by the wayside. And they may have been just as good as the one that got the centrality of power, but they didn't and the other one did. And that's the way it works. So you ended up with Betamax versus, I mean, you can go back to the VCR, you can go back to all sorts of solutions where the suboptimal technology actually became the standard and it was good enough. And for whatever reason, it got global scale. I loved your uh, discussion, Anita, of the Russian uh, experience with the vaccine. And I don't want to delve into it here, but it's very true. Not everybody responded with mRNA. And it's also these artificial barriers where, you know, some governments supported their internal solutions versus the one that works. Um, anyway, it's very unfortunate, but that's the real world. Mm. Yeah, so this sort of fits very well. We got a question from one of the attendees asking this so might fit very well with the discussion about like who is responsible for the scaling and how do we make this? So should there, here's the question, should there be incentives to not only come up with disruptive technology, but also more long-term, long-lasting ones. With the current global warming challenges, for example, it seems like some technologies thought to be disruptive drive lots of investments only to be replaced a few years later, resulting in apparent waste. Mm. Any of you want to, to think about this? Because this is sort of like the, the shared responsibilities, like you're talking about the elements in, in the cluster of innovation, how, who's driving this. So is it the, like the, the government like, or the, like a combination of public and private? So any thoughts about how can we set up incentives? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to hear from the other panelists. But I, I of course have a thought, um, which is that government incentives are artificial, but necessary. At, at the very minimum, government has to facilitate giving permission. Because in a lot of spaces, um, when you're dealing with resources from the commons, in other words, you know, things that deal with a common benefit or use uh, resources from the commons, like the oceans. I mean, it, it, easy, the easiest example of the oceans. Um, I, I, an example I can deal with that I was just dealing with yesterday is we're looking at uh, mining um, from the ocean bottom, right? That's an old problem, right? If, uh, you know, it'd be very disruptive to mine the ocean bottom, but who owns the ocean bottom? I mean, you get into that, the whole issue. So it's, there's a whole governmental issue there of who owns what, right? And um, 
it's going to be, I know it would be ridiculous, but it's going to be a very big issue. Even like in desalination, I don't know if your folks are active in desalination, but we're talking about brine mining and desalination because you use reverse osmosis. Well, who owns the brine? You might think it's naturally the processor, processor of the water, right? Who's doing the desalination would own the, the residual, right? That would make sense. But if the water itself, if we if we attribute ownership to the water, uh, you know, that that water is not necessarily, you, you just extract the water from the ocean. Does that mean you own it? I mean, you know, so you can get into these questions. The reason I'm raising this, why am I raising this? Is because uh, the question was about who gives the support? And what government can do is at least give permissions. That's essential. It can also provide incentives like financial support. But, uh, and it does certainly in healthcare in many ways. And many people are expert at, they make their whole career knowing how to apply for certain types of funding. But all these types of funding, government or private, have a marketplace. They have a solution they're supposed to address. And that marketplace has a time frame. In other words, they're supposed to take something from the bench to uh, you know, a minimum viable product. Venture capitalists want to take things from a minimum viable product to some sort of scale deployment, but not deployment at scale, but where the deployment at scale is visible. And that's when a venture capitalist wants to exit the opportunity because that's when the potential is clear, the risk is reduced, and they can cap capture a lot of the economics because the benefit is clear. And that's where major corporations step in with lower risk profile and it's, and they're satisfied to take a 11% or 15% internal rate of return on the scaling or 20% versus the venture capitalist is honestly looking for a 50 to 100% IRR. But the venture capitalist recognizes that seven out of 10 opportunities that he or she is investing in is going to fail. So they have different profiles where in a major corporation, if, if I said, oh, I'm the VP of engineering and seven out of 10 things I do fail, I won't be the VP of engineering very long. You know, it's there's a different risk profile. So it's a combination of government giving permission and doing fundamental funding of long-term research that has no direct application to a market, but application to a problem. It's private sources like venture capital taking it from the bench to deployment in a minimum viable way. And then a large-scale private enterprise taking it to uh, massive deployment, which might also then include government's uh, resources as well. But it's a dance. It's a dance of many players. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so leading me to think about like these uh, people, planet and profit, we need to make sure that our innovations are keeping in mind all of these uh, uh, parts to be sustainable. And that's a big discussion. So. Uh, we are getting close to the end, so I see I still have lots of questions I would love love to ask you, but to make sure that I have your vision for the future, I will actually kick off with uh, the, the answers uh, or the question that I had for you to look into the crystal ball, each one of you, if I can challenge you to think, like if you could look into the crystal ball and predict what would, be, what would you think would be the next innovation technologies that will have a major impact in the next 10, 15 years, and perhaps since in a Nordic context, if that's possible to, to comment on. So um, Anita, would you like to kick off? Yeah, I can make two comments for the crystal ball. Uh, the, the vision would be to, to make Norway a major player in biotech and learn from our oil and gas history to, to partner up with the best in the world because we have the best uh, health regist uh, registries, we have a uh, digital framework and infrastructure, and why shouldn't Norway be on that map uh, in these days? So that would be my, my first uh, vision in the crystal ball. And then I touched upon my second in my introduction that I am a strong believer in the, in the world of treating nature with nature in a way, even though I'm from pharma, this is my big slogan personally that you know to, to start with the microbiome and the gut health and to really try to understand our 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 um our body and how how disease and and uh, therapy play a role and and all this for me is like at the end of the day if you don't have a, a healthy world you will not have a healthy economy or a healthy uh, uh yeah 
prospect of, of, of life. So, I mean, this is all linked with the economy and also with innovation for me. I'm, I'm a big believer that more innovation in health sector will come in terms of uh, digital, uh, at-home hospitals, home monitoring, diagnostics. I mean, everybody now has done self-testing. Why shouldn't we do more self-testing and, and not and move the, the constraint on the hospital budget, you know, outside as well? I mean, there's so many incentives to do that. And that requires a lot of collaboration and innovation. I think also in the future that the health um, health will uh, circle around AI tools, obviously. I mean, we are creating technology that is faster, gives more accurate accurate uh, answers and and we should uh, take advantage of that i mean we ha don't have enough people to treat all the elderly and all the diabetes patients and all the things that are coming so that's one thing as well and i said a lot of things but let me end with the microbiome as well i i i if i could just give you a picture in the future in 10 to 20 years i hope that when you go to the doctor and ask for something you will have a blood test a gene test and a microbiome test. And based on that profile, the AI tools or the, the, the chatbot or whatever med chatbot would give you, you know, your personal precision diagnostics and therapy and the, the way you should, you know, be treated in your patient journey. So this is my vision. I hope I live to see it. <laughs> will do my best to to work on it from different angles and and uh, love to collaborate with all of you and also the participants so yeah i'll stop there thank you so much anita uh Natsai, you want to um, I, I thought about this um question and maybe my answer won't be terribly coherent um because i i really I don't like this question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I no, it's not personal. I, I always hear you know, like, tell us what's coming. And it's just like, well, um, you know, there's a lot of things that have emerged, uh, particularly around AI, that have completely blindsided us. So let's not get too comfortable about what happens in a year's time, um, uh, even. But but I think it's an important one because it has made me really question this, like, how, what do we what 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 counts as innovation? So I I um I moved to Norway uh, just during the pandemic, um, an act of madness, <laughs> because I I really believe in how psychogeography determines how you see the world, and I've been very intrigued by Norway, its geography, and therefore its culture, and what that demands of people who live here, um, the, the, the light, the dark, the cold, <laughs> um, the beautiful summer, the forest, the water. Um, and I wanted to live somewhere where my mind could be changed by the geography that I exist in. Um, I, I, I lived in London before. It's a completely different paradigm. And it kind of links to what Jerome was talking about earlier, um, about geography as being such an important factor in innovation. And that what happens in Silicon Valley and the culture that exists there surely is unique to that part of the world. And I'm sure you go to other parts of America and it's a completely different culture. So that there's a, there is a question about what are the cultural drivers of technology in a context like Norway? Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. And I would like to posit that, um, anyone building any technology today anywhere in the world has to contend with the cultural technologies that map onto the, 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 the more technical scientific um, formation of tech and innovation as we see it. If we can marry those two things together, something new arises and I'm very intrigued by the cultural resonance of nature in Norway and how that affects how people think about innovation in a place-based paradigm. Because when you look at the bioeconomy in Norway, from a tertiary perspective, you are looking at fishing industries, you're looking at forestry. But when we're talking about industrial biotech, we're talking about using other technological systems to add value. And how you build those systems out to respond to the, nat the, nat 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 the natural geographies of this place, which is about 
Can we get water for, from point A to point B transportation? There are mountains that make transportation very difficult here in some places, feedstocks, um, waste streams. How can we leverage all of those things? And that a biotech um, industry that emerges out of here is true to the values that people hold. And that maybe if you can get that input early, then you start to create a holistic evolution rather than a disruptive moment. Because I don't like this word disruption. <laughs> um, where can we have everyone moving with us towards something um, as equal participants in? And I think to do that, you build on what works, what works, uh, and what is working well. So my next challenge being a uh, uh, now a three-year resident of, of, of Norway is to actually learn the language because if you don't understand the language, you can't really unlock the psychogeography here. So there's this other layer, right? So that's, that's what I would put forward. There are all sorts of other technologies like language that we should be considering as being part of this innovation stack. And then the stakeholders start to change very quickly. The challenges, these institutions that we need to build these contexts in which innovation happen in, like I said, who gets to play the game and when? Thank you. Really uh, inspiring to hear your thoughts coming from London, moving to Norway. So uh, we are getting close to the end, and I was just want to just briefly comment. So the circular by economy, like now with the fish, uh, the byproducts coming out of the fish industry, how we use biotech tools to sort of enhance the value and try to get more products and, and like a more more out of just not only the the food but also like new products that sort of a lot of things happening in that area in norway and maybe also will be part of that so jerry i will challenge you like for a few minutes to sort of also give us your crystal ball view or thoughts well uh, thank you for the invitation yeah i feel like a foreigner i mean it's not for me to you know uh speak on behalf of uh a, a different culture and a different society but things that strike me when I think of Norway, and I've had the sincere pleasure visiting and teaching with you for maybe a half dozen times. So I have some exposure and I have good friends who live there. What strikes me is the opportunity you have. One, it's already been mentioned about exploiting the excellence in oil and gas, right? An extractive industry, that there's tremendous expertise there. And having that crossover into life sciences is a seems like a natural so and that's a, that's enough of a uh, opportunity to focus on for the rest of your life and yeah, i think that's a great goal um but there's also a hidden opportunity in the uniformity of your culture and the you know on a global context you're relatively uniform and you have a i would think a relatively stable cultural set of norms in terms of what's right and what's wrong, a higher level perhaps of trust in government than is normally found, not I would say normally found, but is found in many other places. And that is a very huge asset for experimenting with um, the agency or the power that can be deployed through artificial intelligence. AI is dependent on a data set. It's not the algorithm, it's the data set. And data sets are germane to a certain population. So when you have a more uniform population and you have, you already have, your health system already has, as well, I think as Natsai pointed out, uh, you know, a great um, set of data on your population. I may be wrong, but I think you, you know, I've been led to believe that. Uh, this is a great resource and it's a great resource that AI can be deployed against using the trust, the social trust of the society to begin to experiment with how the professional, the medical professional or the scientist, whoever can use tools of artificial intelligence, not to replace the professional, but to augment the professional so that greater power is given to the individual in assigning treatments or diagnosis. And you probably have an advantage there because of the social trust um, that you may be able to build a leading capability that might then translate to other cultures. 
There might be things that are unique to Norway, but there are likely going to be highly generalizable um, elements of learning. Hmm. So you could become a center of the medical deployment or biological deployment of artificial intelligence. Yes. It's a thought. And it, they're, they're actually, I think when you get underneath it, there's going to be overlay with oil and gas in hmm. there. because They do a lot of modeling and a lot of uh, same types of talents involved. Yeah. So that might be something. Yes. So I see we're running out of time. So I really appreciate the. I think we need new innovations to solve a lot of challenges in the future, both diagnostic, but also like sustainable environment. So I think uh, we need to come together and talk more across discipline like we did today. And I really would like to thank the expert panel for a really excellent contribution and inspiration for us to keep thinking of good solutions. But also I would like to thank the organizers, the Digital Life Norway and the Life Science Clusters for organizing this webinar. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope to, to, to meet you again and discuss further because I still have lots of more questions that I would like to address. So thank you so much.